Hello from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. This is the Nick Zentner Geology Podcast, Episode 91. The Snake River was here? Thanks for listening. I've been busy. It's May here in Ellensburg. The flowers are out. There's no shortage of things to do. It's my favorite time of the year. I think you've heard words like that before, but I really mean it this time. Uh, It's been a cool spring, but uh, we do have these days now that are simply glorious, and I I hope things are going well in your world. I don't know if I'm going to do a preamble this time. Let's invert this. How about I go right to the Snake River thing and get that uh, rolling with you, and then and I don't know if that's going to be a full 30 minutes. And then after that, I'll, I'll, I've, I can touch on a few of the other things I've been doing, but I've, I've kind of lost track, really, to be honest. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been a real blender of activity. Lot, lots of different kinds of things that I'm, that I'm doing feels like simultaneously. So let's go to the snake thing first, the snake river thing first. Um, I was up on Saddle Mountains with my little gizmo and my iPhone Sunday morning. And I'm going to be back doing Saddle Mountain stuff both days this upcoming weekend. So I I thought I wanted to get over there and start thinking about the Saddle Mountains a fair amount. It's been a few years since I was over there doing um, some work. And, you know, the work for me means, uh, you know, taking papers, reading them, putting little programs together, shooting video, leading a field trip, whatever. So, you know, I drove to the top of Saddle Mountains and uh, I shared how to drive up there with the audience. I don't think I'll do a pop-up up there, but anyway, that's, 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 that's one thing. And, and I just happened to remember that um, Lydia Steich from the United States Geological Survey published a paper last year uh, proposing an idea that the Snake River had a much different course more than three million years ago. And this relates to Hell's Canyon. This relates to Yellowstone National Park, believe it or not. This relates to uh, Central Washington, these places that don't normally go, are connected in people's minds. And let me make her statement first of all. She has evidence that the Snake River, older than three million years ago, got started in Yellowstone, as it does today, and flowed north through Montana, through the panhandle of Idaho, into northern Washington, the Snake River I'm talking about, And I need to follow up with her, but she has the Snake River, I think, like coming down the Grand Coulee (laughs) and then making its way to Saddle Mountains. In other words, the Snake River is coming down the Grand Coulee. Now, this is a Grand Coulee before the Ice Age. So this is this is not you know Dry Falls isn't there yet but there there's some sort of old river channel well, I'm getting excited just thinking about this there's some sort of river channel that you know a V-shaped kind of you know modest little valley uh, that the snake perhaps was coming down pre Ice Age coming down I mean from north to south coming down I mean from Grand Coulee Dam area today heading south to Soap Lake didn't exist at the time. You know you know what I'm saying now, right? Older than three million years ago, the Snake River is working its way towards Saddle Mountains, and Saddle Mountains are in central Washington, Vantage, Othello. Um, it's an east-west trending ridge. It's quite impressive, and we have good evidence that that Saddle Mountains ridge uh, was high, was big, was there three million years ago and four million years ago and five million years ago and six million years ago. Yeah, that's the time frame we're talking about. Okay, now hang on. I'm thinking about her maps and the timing of this. Okay, so this... Okay, sharing, doing this with you right now gives me the sense that 
I might need to do a follow-up. So it, it's it's more uh, embryonic than normal with me, uh, meaning that I, I was reading that paper carefully for the first time at the breakfast table. Two hours later, I'm filming <laughs> and, you know, showing the viewers the paper as I'm sitting um, with my little backpack and everything and talking about her evidence, which I'm about to get to. But uh, I didn't even have the timing of it kind of carefully in my mind. And now I'm doing this with you, and I'm remembering that I don't really have the timing in mind. I'm saying older than three, but I think she has the snake stopping to come up into Washington. Yeah. Okay, I got to figure that out. Sorry to waste your time. <laughs> Sorry to waste your time. We'll say older than three, but it's maybe, you know, older than five. Okay, the point I'm trying to make is that Lydia Steich, for the first time, has evidence of the Snake River getting into Washington before the Ice Age. That's not a big statement. But it's not just coming into the southeast corner of Washington. The Snake River is is coming through Montana, is getting into northern Washington, and is heading south. The Snake River is heading south as it leaves northern Washington, and it's heading south directly to the Saddle Mountains, and it's hanging a right and flowing west along the north face of the Saddle Mountains. Anybody still with me? And then that Snake River is hanging a hard left and going through Sentinel Gap right there at Beverly. These are dinky little towns in Washington. I don't expect you to follow if you're listening from Australia. But the, the idea is we have a, a major river in the American West that nobody had proposed uh, doing that course until Lydia's work. Okay, well, that's a pretty bold statement, you say. What evidence does she have? Is it this river cobble thing? She's not using river cobble. She's using river sand that she can date. She's using river sand that she can analyze for, you guessed it, zircon, detrital zircon, little zircon minerals that were carried by the river, and other sand grains as well that, have a source, right? Rivers are carrying, rivers carry sediment, and the sediment is coming from upstream, and if you eventually work your way up those tributaries and get to the bedrock that's at the head of the river system, you can get a sense of, of what a river's sand distribute. I'm choosing my words carefully now. How do I say it? This, this, is, this is really the first time I've tried to teach these these concepts. Okay, let me say it this way. Lydia's paper has a work with modern rivers in the West and their typical sand signatures. And then she's also got the same kinds of detrital zircon plots for rivers long ago. The same rivers long ago, but she has a way to like make a case that she has ancestral river detrital zircon collections versus modern river detrital zircon. I'm still, I'm totally, to be totally honest, I'm still kind of fuzzy with the details there. So as I as I continue to try to think this out with you right here, I haven't even had breakfast yet. But I just got a couple emails. Uh, sitting there drinking coffee about about the podcast and how much people are enjoying it and like motivated me to come down here so this one's particularly loose uh so i'm not doing a great job here but in a, in a way it, this this struggle with you is trying is helping me see that that there's more that needs to be done if i want to really communicate this paper properly it's not looking at river cobbles and saying that the river used to be here and the river is no longer here. It's digging into sedimentary material, mostly sand, and making a case for the Snake River flowing in the course that I just tried to describe. 
And you're like, okay, you're really saying that the Yellowstone area is the source of the snake? Yeah, it still is today. And then you're like, well, wait a minute. I know about the Yellowstone hotspot, and I know that the area we now call Yellowstone National Park is a topographic high where the Yellowstone mantle plume is, is thermally inflating that portion of the North American crust. And I know that's a plateau, Yellowstone today. This is you talking. But I also know that if we go back in time, that Yellowstone Plateau hasn't always been in northwestern Wyoming. And you're right. And that's one of the main points of the paper. It's in the title of the paper. Something about major reorganization of the Snake River system, you know, as, I'm making it up now, as, uh, what did she say? Something with the Yellowstone hotspot as influenced by the Yellowstone hotspot or something. Wow, okay, this is, yeah. Th there's a lot of meat on this bone. Just realizing this right now, trying to get this into plain English for everybody. Hang with me. So North America's plate, you've heard this before, I think. North America's plate has been moving southwest over a stationary mantle plume called the Yellowstone mantle plume. The result of that southwestward moving North American plate over a stationary mantle plume in southern Idaho means that there is the Snake River Plain, which has both basalts and rhyolites, bimodal volcanism, stretching across southern Idaho. And without having that concept, all you see is that there is a heat source that is marching its way to the northeast Twin Falls, Idaho, then it's moving northeast. American Falls, Idaho, Pocatello, Idaho, Idaho Falls, Idaho, Rexburg, Idaho, and then crossing the border up to northwestern Wyoming. What I just described are little towns in southern Idaho and this northeastward migrating heat source known as the Yellowstone Hotspot. And we have volcanic deposits from each of those snapshots in time. Calderas, ignimbrites, that sort of thing. Well, is the heat source really moving northeast? No, it's the North American plate drifting to the southwest. But the point here is that wherever you are in time and in space in southern Idaho, you have a mantle plume. If the mantle plume is beneath your town, you are high. You are a plateau. Rivers are flowing, oh, got it? Rivers are flowing away from you as they are today. If you look at a map of Yellowstone Park, the modern rivers today are flowing away from the Yellowstone Plateau. It's a high place because of that mantle plume underneath. So the concept here is that as the Snake River Plain of southern Idaho was getting established, was getting developed, was forming, you have this migrating topographic high from southwest to northeast. And so, therefore, rivers are flowing away from that topographic high, and the topographic high is, is moving. So the, the, the headwaters of these river systems is moving northeast. Boy, difficult. Wow. I'm really going to have to practice this one. This is my first... Boy, why didn't I have this in my mind that this was going to be a challenging thing to discuss? The reason I'm trying to get into this at the 14-minute mark is that if you simply say, like I did on camera last Sunday morning, that the Snake River used to flow from northwest Wyoming to Washington through Montana, I don't think anybody said it in the comments below, because it's an intelligent group. But, you know, a few dull knives in the drawer might go, well, that's bullshit. We got, you got, there's no way a river can flow from Idaho through Montana to Wyoming, uh, sorry, uh, to Washington, because there's mountain ranges that 
there's no way a river can go up and over the mountain range. Okay, well, now we're getting to it. If we're 4 million years ago, 5 million years ago, the topography is different. The high point is where the mantle plume is. Those mountain ranges, Monida Pass, I don't even know the names of the mountain passes that she has in that in that paper, but she's she's carefully looked at these elevations and she's carefully found some of this smoking gun detrital zircon snake river sand stretched out in a line, I think, through Montana, through Panhandle of Idaho, into northern Washington, coming down to Saddle Mountains. To finish my thought, I have I'm confident this one is not working for you. <laughs> But if nothing else, you're, you're, you're helping kind of think this through with me in a weird way. What happens when the mantle plume leaves your area in southern Idaho? The answer is the crust cools off and it sinks. It subsides. That was the topic of my master's thesis. I was working on subsidence of the eastern Snake River Plain. And I was mapping normal faults on the north edge of the Snake River Plain in the Heise volcanic field. And I was mapping normal faults related to basin and range extension. And then I had another set of normal faults that were related to this gradual subsidence or sinking of the eastern Snake River Plain. That's important because if you subside the crust in the Snake River Plain, you're going to influence the rivers, of course. And so what used to be a topographic high is now a topographic low. You're, you're deflating the crust in, in uh, what is now the Snake River Plain. And so those old pathways are no longer pathways because you have this changing elevation. The other reason, okay, interesting thought here. So, the, so you're, you're, you're really changing elevations of the crust in the last 10 million years in the Northwest two reasons come to mind with this discussion of a potential snake river coming up into central Washington. One is what I just described. You have a huge heat source with the Yellowstone mantle plume and you lower the crust after you cool the crust off because that mantle plume has moved on. The other way that we're dramatically changing the highs and lows and therefore dramatically changing where rivers flow is from tectonic uplift, much of it due to the clockwise rotation of the Pacific Northwest and Saddle Mountains itself being developed and rising and knuckling up due to compression of the crust, which is something I've talked about a number of times before. So you can change river pathways because you're lifting ridges tectonically and the rivers are uh, deflected or changed or stopped. Or in the case of this Yellowstone mantle plume story, which is the headwater area of the snake, you do this thermal sinking after the heat source moves away. Wow. So I've just decided with you right now, I'm going to do another one of those. I'm going to go, I'm going to be back up on the Saddle Mountains this weekend. And I think maybe Saturday, yeah, maybe Saturday, I'm going to, I'm going to be with a guy who's got some private land up on top of Saddle Mountains and he's got some places he wants to show me. And these days I'm kind of deflecting most of those offers. There's just too much, too many tips coming in, et cetera. But this guy contacted me two years ago, and I still haven't followed through on that. So we're going to meet up and, and check that out Saturday. Um, so I think I'm going to shoot another little video up there and try to visualize and add to what I was doing last Sunday morning. So thanks for that. 20-minute uh, mark. Okay, yeah. Um, so I'm a bit scattered, first of all, because I haven't thought that paper through as much as I want to, obviously. So this is kind of like a super helpful to me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but I do want to comment briefly on, on these other activities I've been doing. If you've been uh, following the YouTube channel, there have been a, uh, more and more, as promised, more and more videos this month on 
the geology department at Central. And I think it's working. I mean, people are generally very nice in the YouTube comments, and they leave encouraging words, and I always appreciate it. But if there's enough of those, then I guess it, they're not just being nice, that it, that they mean it. So my initial thought was, I, well, the real thought is, I want to showcase the department where I work. And our university is terrible with public relations, as most universities are. In particular, there are videos that are, uh, you know, Central Washington University does have a YouTube channel. Uh, I know the guy who's been making the videos. There's all sorts of reasons that he's not producing a lot of stuff. And I mean, you know, even if there is a video, it's, it's like, you know, I don't know, 110 people that see it or something. The, the whole thing, it's just it's so discouraging. And there's just so much amazing stuff going on. So, you know, it was kind of me just talking to myself, basically, and saying, well, you have a platform now, mainly due to the pandemic. You've got a lot more people watching your YouTube channel than something at Central. And, you know, why not uh, share what's going on? Uh, I don't. I don't work in a vacuum. There's a, there's a whole collection of people. We have a a facility of a building that's that's pretty fancy. So it's kind of an experiment for me. But it's also just you know a hope that I can show people what we have here. And I think I probably shared this last time. Uh, my goal is to to have an influx of geology majors while there are other departments on campus who are going the opposite direction and nobody really knows how much we will be back to normal business this fall with enrollments and everything else it's still kind of a ghost town i gotta say if you see some of these videos my, the, the the format i've stumbled into which i kind of like not everybody loves it but i i, I think it works um, I, I literally walk around on campus with one of our faculty members, and then I keep it rolling, and we walk right into the building. I like, I've like i always liked that. I'm not a huge uh, movie fan, but I, I do love long shots for some reason. Do you know what I mean? If you have, if you have a favorite movie, and it's kind of an arty movie, and then there's, there's some folks who say, oh, my God, did you see that was all one take? That was all one shot. They went from this and to that and to this and all the artistry that went into that. Well, I'm not saying I'm full of art. I'm just, I just like that concept of you. It's almost like you're hiking on a trail and the scenery keeps changing. I've always commented on that to Liz. I don't think she totally gets what I'm saying. There's something about just following this little path and as you just round the corner, you're out of some sort of lush forest, and now you're into this deep canyon, and then you keep following that little path, and it changes again, and you've got this kind of desert scene. I don't know. It's this little thread that's taking you all through these different scenery changes, almost like you're in some sort of play. Boy, what am I talking about right now? Good question. So I like the concept of just keeping it rolling. As I was explaining to a couple of the folks I was doing these with recently, they're like, wow, we, we just did that this morning. And, and you have and somebody told me it's on YouTube. That was like, it only took you four hours. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, I like the I like the immediacy of it. And they're like, well, do, doesn't it take you like a, a long time to edit? And I'm like, well. Not really. And the style of that uh, allows me to just keep most of it, basically. I take a few things out if somebody just says, look, that's a dumb question. Why did you ask me that? I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to look stupid if you do. So I take it out. Actually, nobody says that. But I, 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 they trust me, and I, I don't want them to look dumb. I got no problem looking dumb, but I, for them, I, you know, they trust me. They don't want to look foolish or put in an awkward position. But on the other hand, I keep most of it, including me just saying on camera, like, oh, I'm just going to keep it rolling and 
I'm always like, I'm listening hard as I can, trying to ask decent questions, but I'm also in the back of my mind going, what can we do that's like unexpected? So the one I posted yesterday with Walter Zaliga, we're, we're on the third floor looking at his seismometer and, and uh, I said, hey, can you get us on the roof? <laughs> He's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so we just kept it rolling, filmed as we were going up the elevator, filmed as we came up onto the roof. I mean, it's just, it's fun. It's fun to, to share the people that I work with. And, you know, I'll probably do another one of these just talking about those. But anyway, that's that's been on my mind lately. And I don't want it to be totally like that on my YouTube channel. So I'm out doing the, the normal geology stuff as well to kind of balance things out. And I did another pop-up event this time out at uh, Vantage. Uh, people hiked 30 minutes up a road and, and we met out at an erratic and talked. State Parks wasn't happy with that. We got off of the road and threatened or whatever. It's like, you know. So it just reinforces that I just like doing things solo. I don't I don't deal with any organizations or anything. I just kind of do it. And the spirit of it is pure. Uh, it's nothing but good vibes. And somebody sitting in an office somewhere saying that you violated uh, rule 73.44. I mean, go jump in a lake. So I won't be going to state parks anymore, I don't think. It's been a good experience to just keep things fresh. And last thing I'll say, I think, before I sign off is that um, one of the reasons to do the pop-up events is to help me um, visit with people who have traveled from a long way away. That's a thing now. So it's to be expected, I guess. Still kind of takes me by surprise. But uh, we've got people from other countries coming in. Uh, spending their vacation in Washington, visiting some of these places that they have been seeing during the pandemic. Plenty of people from around the country flying in. And so at these pop-up events, somebody will say, I just, I just lucked out, you know. I, was, I, was, I flew in. I, I wanted to see these places. I you know, didn't want to bother you. And uh, I saw you announce the pop-up 48 hours in advance. And so I improvised, and, uh, and here I am. So you know, it's a guy from Louisiana, a guy from, I forget, back east somewhere. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's a lot of people now who are on the receiving end of the videos and, and even the podcasts. And there are times that I'm a bit overwhelmed by that. Most of the time, I'm just like, hey, you know, everybody, I think, kind of gets what I'm up to. Uh, they're not hassling me much now I, I it's a wrong way to say that everybody's very kind and you know officially i'm a public outreach person so i should be visiting with every last person who says hi and so i'm still kind of struggling with that how much time do i want to spend uh, how much time should i be spending visiting with individual people especially if they came from a long way away so i'm still wrestling with that uh but i think I don't know how many people are going to be in the hallways of the building. I guess that's one thing that I'd be curious about. Like the, the, I'll finish with this. So, so in his, I didn't want to interview the faculty just you know in their office. That's been done a million times. It's totally static. It's framed real tight, and they're talking about this stuff that you know a very small percentage of the audience is really going to stick with. Um, they'll they'll want to click that off as soon as possible. So I knew I wanted some movement as I'm talking, okay? I'm talking about these CW geology videos that I've been doing recently. I don't know what there are now, six or seven of them maybe. And then I kind of had the idea, well, what if we're moving? What if we're walking? And I'm filming as I'm walking and talking with these guys. That's good. Well, a couple of the gals... We're such fast walkers. They're just kind of high-powered uh, people anyway. And so, 
you know, I'm basically broken into a trot to keep up with these guys. So the scenery behind us is just flying by, you know. Uh, so that, um, you know, and I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, there, no stage direction. There's no like, hey, would you please slow down? I want this to be, you know, you know, it's kind of row with it. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that I'm, I'm doing these videos where I'm, I'm, truly walking on campus to try to it's a beautiful campus i think there's blue skies and there's flowers and there's beautiful buildings and and if you look carefully there's hardly any students and you're like oh they must have filmed this at like eight in the morning no it's like noon on a wednesday like i don't know where these students are i mean it, it is a major question mark like even now what are some what's going on are these kids not going to class are these kids not on campus because of the pandemic and they're we're still doing some virtual stuff i don't even know i know in geology we're not virtual i know in geology it's it's back to business but boy i just walk and look around i'm like what is we're still it's may of 2022 so it is a major question i guess what i'm doing i'm trying is just to kind of in my own small way, trying to pick up a few extra people interested in geology so that the health of our geology department remains. We'll see. Maybe this is all for naught. Maybe nobody's got the money or the interest to go to a university anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if that's the case, then, wow, it's going to be an interesting decade to see these universities across the country or maybe around the world just crumble. I, I, I have no idea. I don't think anybody really does. Okay, freelance time really at the end. I kept saying I'm. this is about it, but I think I want to say this. I wonder if it's more than academic. Sorry, I wonder if it's more than economic. Like, let's say that there's that these projections are true. And that our university is going to be a noticeably smaller incoming freshman class this September. And I, I think most universities are, are bracing for that. I think my question is, is it totally economic? Is it totally that the economy has changed so dramatically that that the people who would normally come to universities just don't come anymore because they can't afford it? I, I think that's what many people will conclude if that really does happen this fall. But I wonder how much of it are these kids are still at home in bed just not able to handle coming back to real life. I'm trying to choose my words carefully here, but I just my own little observations and listening to my wife who teaches at the high school. Uh, this is a uh, worrisome time for us older people looking at young people and going, boy, we, we, we can't even do basic hygiene here. Like just as a functioning member of of society we are we are still with many of these young people in a uh, a traumatic state i'm out of my element here i don't know really what i'm talking about i'm just trying to say that i i, I think i think this business about trying to get these young people out of their bedrooms and back into some semblance of a normal life and have them totally healthy, physically and mentally, and plugging back into what places like our geology department are. I don't think it's a magic wand thing. I think we, we got a significant number of people who are not coming back to universities just because it's a lot easier just to stay home and uh, and find ways to avoid being with the greater good. Boy, dark way to end it. I, I hope I'm way off on that, but 
Man, I, I wonder. I wonder. So, to finish in an uplifting way, there are some videos waiting for you that might be of interest to you if you'd like to experience a beautiful building with energized people who are doing their best. And you can feel, I think you can feel the energy. I can think you can feel the optimism, at least in our little world. And I'm hoping to share that with everybody. If nothing else, just to show that there's still some smart, motivated, younger people doing their thing. Well, smart, younger, motivated people listening to this podcast, thank you for tuning in. Pretty scattered, more scattered than normal, especially that Snake River paper, which I will probably do another podcast on once I get my act together. But for now, I thank you for listening to this episode. I love you, and goodbye.